today I'm going to talk about faith. I'm going to talk about faith, growing in faith. And we're going to read from Luke chapter 17, verse 5 and 6. Now, this is a question that many of us ask, and this is something that I talked about a couple of weeks ago during Alpha course. It's not the same thing, but I wanted to talk to you about faith. In Luke chapter 17, verse 5 and 6, let's read it all together in one voice. Let's begin. The apostle said to the Lord, Show us how to increase our faith. The Lord answered, If you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mulberry tree, May you be uprooted and thrown into the sea, and it would obey you. This passage is it's, it talks about a moment where disciples came to Jesus. And the question that they had was, Jesus, how can we have faith? How can we believe? You know, when we look at this question, I think many of us, we take this lightly. But when you really think about it, it is not a, very, it is not a light question. It is not a simple question. In fact, this was a very serious and very important question. You see, these disciples... You know, the ironic thing is, it was the disciples, the followers of Jesus, the students, the followers, the believers who, be, who have been with Jesus, who have witnessed many miracles, who have heard this amazing teaching, and yet, it's the disciples that's coming to Jesus and said, Jesus, show us how to increase our faith. In other, in other words, they wanted faith. They wanted more faith. And they're saying, how can we have faith? The reason for this is this. Faith is not an easy thing. It is not a simple thing. You know, for us, if we say to ourselves, you know, if we were in the, in, the, in the disciples' shoes, if we were in their situation, we would never ask this question to Jesus. How can we increase our faith? Because if I have witnessed Jesus, if I had seen all the miracles that he did, if I had heard directly from Jesus all the amazing, profound teachings there's no way I would have to ask Jesus, how can I have faith? Because it would come naturally. At least that's what we would think. But the reality is, faith is not a simple thing, nor is it an easy thing. A few months ago, uh, Luke and I were talking. It was actually a few months ago, about, I don't know, six, seven, eight months ago. And he made a joke. Uh, I think it was me, Luke, and Robin. And, and I forget the joke, but he was making a reference to his biceps, his arm. I think I forget the joke, but maybe you said, like, you know, Pastor Paul, have you seen my guns? I'm like, no. He says, really? Here it is. And you know, in America, they call your biceps guns, you know. So sometimes they say, you know, oh, really? Have you seen my cannon? You know, it's a bigger gun, you know, and so forth. You know, you know we're, you know, grown men, we don't, you know, He's joking, I'm joking, but in reality, grown men should not be envious of other people's physique and so forth. But to be honest with you, when Luke showed me his muscle, because he had joined, a, you know, he wasn't bragging or anything like that, but he had just joined a health club. And I guess he had been working out, and I would have done the same thing. But he was saying, oh, man, I've been working out and doing curls, and, you know, curls means working on your biceps. And he actually flexed, and I touched it, and I was pretty impressed. It was very big. <laughs> in fact, I had to stretch up my hands like this to, you know, to at least grab one end of the other you know, of his arm. You know, Luke's getting embarrassed. He gets embarrassed very easily. And his face is like a fire hydrant right now. Um, but what made it, you know, what made me envious was that, and then after I did that, I went to touch my bicep. While I had to do this to touch Luke's bicep, I, I, I could do this and touch my bicep. You know, I'm a man, and you know, all, you know, I don't want to say all, but most male, we have this ego. And I said, you know, it's embarrassing, you know. I'm a man too, you know, so I decided, you know, I'm going to work out too. Actually, that was the beginning of where it motivated me to uh, buy a weight set. So actually, I had one of my students come to my office and order online a weight set because I don't have time to go to the gym nor the money. And I figured, you know, the best time to do it is in my office because... And I do push-ups, but push-ups only work on your triceps and your chest. And I do it just because, you know, when I'm sleepy, that, you know, I work out to, so that I won't be uh, sleepy. So anyway, I ordered that, and then I started to, you know, do curls. 
Wow, really, again, it's embarrassing, but the, the amount of weight, I think, is 15 kilograms. Maybe, I don't know. I don't know how big it is, but it's not a lot of weight. And I just want you to know, again, I, I don't mean to boast, but I used to work out a lot when I was younger, and I used to have more muscles. Uh, you think, yeah, he's kidding, he's making things up, but I really, I, I used to have more muscles. And so, you know, I, I, you know, I saw that, I'm like, oh, you know, I can, I can do this. So I put all the weights, and I was going to do my one hand curl. I couldn't even lift it up. <laughs> Again, there was nobody there, so okay. So I decided to do two hand. Oh my goodness, I could barely do it with two hands. And just so you know, I, I did a two hand curl, and I could barely do five. One, two, three, and four, and five. Oh, it was so hard, and it was a, it was a, it was a hit on my ego. Either. But you know, I didn't give up. I said to myself, you know, I just bought this, so I was all excited. And again, this is going to be, sound really, really funny and ridiculous, but I'm, I'm just very open and honest with you guys. Uh, I have a way of motivating myself to exercise. And what it is, is I go to the internet, and I go into the YouTube website. You know what YouTube is, where they show all the video clips and so forth. I go into YouTube, and I type in Rocky. Rocky Balboa. Okay. And in, uh, in Rocky II, they have a scene where he's training. It's like, you know, you know, you know, bam, 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 You know what? You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> and it shows him, you know, running and doing curls. And oh, it just, it's really, the music and the video is very inspirational and motivational. So every time I see that, I feel motivated to exercise. So. You know, I turn that on. When I hear the music, oh, yeah, I start doing push-ups and I do curls. <laughs> I shouldn't have shared that. It's so embarrassing. But that's what I do. But anyway, the first time I did it, I could do five. But then I didn't give up. I keep doing it. And I keep doing it. And the more I did it, guess what? The stronger I got. You know, I, and I do it and I, get, I, get, I do more and I do more. And nowadays, I can do 30 of those curls, which I could only do five at the, in, in the beginning. And the principle about faith is the same thing. Too often we ask ourselves, you know, how do we increase faith? I want faith. I look at this person and this person prays and, and lives their lives with so much faith. I want that. But we ask ourselves, we want it, but then we don't know how to get it. We, we think to ourselves, faith is something that just comes to us all of a sudden. In most people, that's not the case. Just like we build our body, faith needs to be built up too. And just as, as we exercise, we, you know, the more we exercise, the more we can do, and the more our muscle grows, it is the same principle with our faith. The more we exercise our faith, the more we grow. But before we talk about that any further, I want to ask you this question. What really is faith? Do we know what faith really is? Simply put, faith is believing and trusting in God. Faith is believing and trusting in God. Now, this is a very, very important thing for obvious reason. Because the Bible tells us that it is by faith we are saved. In Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, God saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift of God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. You see, faith is a very, very important thing. Why? Because it is faith that we have in God, in Jesus Christ, that saves us. It is not because we are good people. It is not because we are smart. It is not because we are wealthy. And it is not because we come to church. It is by faith in Jesus Christ that we are saved and we get to go to heaven. So see... Faith, therefore, is a very important and crucial thing. It is not something that, you know, we should take it lightly. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world so much that He gave His one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in Him will not perish, but have eternal life. Again, we are saved by faith. When we believe, when we have that belief and trust, that is what gives us eternal life in heaven. 
But as I mentioned earlier, faith is not an easy thing to have. Do you know why? Because real faith, by definition, is a belief in something that is unseen. That is what faith is. Too often we say to ourselves, well, you know what? I cannot believe. I'm not going to believe unless I see evidence. But you know what? If you have all the evidence in the world and then believe, then that is not faith. Faith is something that you give and you trust and you believe and depend on, even though there's not all the evidence exists. If I were to tell you, you know, if I were to say, you know what? I believe if I jump from here to there, I'm not going to die. I believe. I have faith. That is not faith. For you to say, I'm going to believe that I will not die, you are crazy for thinking that. Because the common sense dictates to you, logic dictates to you, and scientific fact dictates to you, and everything that you see tells you, if you jump from here to there, you're not going to die. It does not require faith for me to jump from here to there. Faith is believing in something that is unseen. Unseen by us. But we, even though we cannot see, we choose to believe. And we choose to trust. So the simple nature of faith tells us it is not an easy thing for people to have. Actually, Bible gives us a perfect definition in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. It says, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. In things that we cannot see. I don't, you know, in America, I don't know whether they still do this or not, but I remember when I, when I was in high school days, I saw this often where in companies, they would have seminars and they would have workshops. And one of their, one of their objective for doing things is because they wanted to develop unity within the group. You know, you have a company, you have workers, and oftentimes they don't know each other. And they don't even sometimes like each other. They don't trust each other. But they realize that in order for a company to succeed, and which is true, that you must learn to trust each other and work together. So oftentimes companies, small companies or big companies, they would go on retreats. And one of the activities that they would oftentimes do is this. They would tell them, okay, what I want you to do is pair up together and, you know, pair up two people. And then what you do is both of you face the same direction while one person is standing in front and one person is standing right behind. And the exercise is this, that the person in front, without looking back, they have to look forward and straight ahead, put their hands like this, and they have to just simply fall back. Trusting, believing and trusting that the person behind you will catch you. Now, you may think to yourself, well, oh, that's not too difficult. Have you tried it? I've tried it a couple of times. It is not easy. Because the first few times, not just one, not just twice, but three, four times, when you do it, every time you do it, you always bend your knees, trying to you know, lighten your fall. Because it is difficult for us to do that. It is difficult for us, by nature, to believe and to trust in something that we cannot see. It is not part of our nature. Many of us, we go and we always take a step back. We just cannot do it. By nature, we are a faithless creature. We don't do things unless we see clear evidence, unless we see it with our eyes. I remember when William and Faith, when they were young, when they were like two years old, maybe even three, Oftentimes, you know, I would play with them and I would put, put them on the dining room table or sometimes in the kitchen, like, uh, what do you call it? Uh, kitchen area. I'm losing my English, but I would put them on the tables in different high places. And I would tell them, you know, I say, come to daddy. And then I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't just stand right there. I would actually take about a step or two, you know, away from the table. And, you know, even though it's uh, for the child, it's a long distance, distance. William and Faith would just jump into my arms and I would catch them. And they would love it. They loved the feeling of just being in the air and, and me catching them. And they would just giggle and laugh and so forth. Yeah. yeah, and I liked that too. But the amazing thing is that, not the amazing, but the funny thing is that older they got, they began to lose that faith. 
when they got to be five, six, I still try it even now when they're seven, eight years old. I will tell them when they jump up. Now they're heavy, but I'm still strong enough to catch them. I'll tell them, hey, jump. Trust daddy and jump. And William goes, oh, no, 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 no. You know? He said, come closer, come closer. I said, no, William, jump. I said, oh, no, just come a little bit closer. I said, no, 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 trust daddy, jump. It's very, very difficult for them. It, t- it takes me usually about a minute or two of persuading, persuasion before they finally decide to do it. I say, come on, trust daddy. Daddy can do it. He's done it before. Okay? And then they finally, they jump. As soon as they jump, they immediately try to reach for me. You know, and I grab them and I catch them. Again, they have a great time. They laugh and so forth. And then after the first time, now they believe. Now they trust me. And then they utter the you know, inevitable words. Again, daddy, again and again and again. And we do it again. See, we are creatures where faith does not come naturally to us. It is something that has to be worked on. It has, it's something that has to be built. Again, going back to what I mentioned earlier, Bible tells us that it is, not by, it is by faith. It is that faith that saves us. Not, be, not because we're good or smart, but it's that faith and belief and trust in Jesus. It's a belief and trust that Jesus is our God, that is our Savior, but more importantly, that He's also our Father that loves us, that died for us. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 11, verse 11 and 13. It gives us a very good illustration of who our God is, who Jesus is. It says, You fathers, if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? Or if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Of course not. So if you sinful people know how to give give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The faith that we have in God is is a belief that our God is our Savior, that He's our Lord, but it's also the belief and trust that He is our Father that loves us, that cares for us. You know, when I was growing up, believe it or not, our family was not rich. In fact, we were poor. I remember when we first moved to the United States in 1978, we lived in a two-bedroom apartment. And you say to yourself, in Korea, wow, two-bedroom, that's big. No, no. In America, it's, uh, it's not that big. And more importantly, we got an apartment in a very poor, inexpensive neighborhood. In fact, because we had so little money, we, didn't, we couldn't afford to buy any furniture. So we only bought one bed. In America, people don't sleep on floors. So we had one bed, and our mother and father, my mother and father, used that. And for the rest of us, me, my brother, and my sister, you know, We're boys and girls, but we all actually shared one room. And we couldn't afford a bed, so we just bought two, I'm sorry, we didn't even buy. Somebody gave us two spring mattresses. And we put that on the floor, and we slept on the floor. And for many, many years, my parents worked as janitors. And actually, we talked about this in class a few days ago, that in Korea, you know, the status thing is so important, you know that if you're a janitor, someone that cleans buildings and so forth for a living, they say sometimes you know, they're looked upon as a second-class citizen. Well, my parents worked as janitors for many years. They cleaned office buildings. They cleaned gas stations. And even in that type of job, oftentimes uh, they would go without work for a month or two because even those type of jobs were hard to come by because many other people wanted those type of jobs. Even though we lived, we weren't rich. Even though, you know, we didn't have much. But I never, for a minute, during my life at that moment, at that time, ever doubted that I would not have any food to eat. I always knew, I always believed, I always trusted my parents that no matter what the situation, they were always going to have food. You know why? Because we always did. 
no matter how poor we were, no matter how little we had, I always knew that if I needed something, that my parents were going to get it for me. I believed in my parents. I trusted them. I never doubted that they would not provide because I know that they're my parents and they, all, they love me and they've always provided for me. You see, this is the faith. This is the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Not only that he is our God, not only that he is our Lord, not only that he is our Savior who saved us from life in hell, but it is also our Father who loves us. Father that created us. And from the moment that we were born to the moment, from this to this moment now, God has never abandoned us. God has never forsaken us. He has never given us something that was harmful to us. But everything that God has done for us was ultimately, it was for our benefit. See, that is the faith that we must have in God. But for those of us who do not have faith, you may be asking, well, how can we have it? And for those of us who, do, who, do, you know, who does have faith, some of us might be asking, well, how can we have more? How can we grow? The answer is simple. Listen carefully. You have faith when you choose to have faith. And you grow in faith when you choose to exercise your faith. You see, faith in God is not something that just comes to you. I mean, there are instances where those things happen. But for most of us, faith is something that we choose to have. And what many people don't realize is, is that faith starts with a decision. You see, God has already provided all the things that we need to have faith. You look around the world. You look at this world. You look at all the creations. You look at our lives. You look at all the blessings that God's given to us. You look at your family. You look at the people that love you, the friends that care for you. You look at your life from even though you may not have believed. You look at all the, things, all the ways that God protected you and provided for you. You see, we already have enough to have faith. But for us to actualize that faith, it requires a decision on our part. It is a choice on our part. Hebrews 11.1, 1, I read earlier, faith is a confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. You see, faith is saying that, you know what, even though I may not understand everything, even though I may not see everything, because I do not know the future, even though there are many unseen and unknown things, it says, you know what, I choose to have hope. I choose to believe. I will decide to trust in God. We say, Lord, everything that I've heard and learned about you, it makes sense. Everything that I've seen in my life tells me that I need to trust you. But there's still a lot of things that I do not understand. But Lord, today I choose to trust in you. It is a decision. Faith will not all of a sudden come into you and grow. And for those of us who are waiting for that, chances are it's not going to happen. It is a choice and it is a decision. That's how faith begins for most of us. And after that, our faith, how do, we, how, does, how do we grow it? How can we make it grow? Our faith grows, like I mentioned, like everything else in life. It grows when we exercise it. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. It says, Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and live righteously, and it will give you everything you need. How do you exercise faith? You exercise your faith by seeking God first above all else. Trusting and believing that when we seek after God first, that everything else, God will take care of. And over the years, my faith 
has grown and grown and grown. And there are moments in, moments in my life, just like Amiti shared and just like most of you guys have experienced, there are moments in life, there are times in our lives where it feels like God is distant from us. And there are moments in our lives where we feel like, you know, God, why is he doing this? And our faith is some, somewhat tested and shaken. But that is natural. But from my experience, from the moment I gave my life 21 years ago, my faith has grown and grown and grown. And it's grown because I have learned to trust in God with little things. I've learned to believe in God for the little things. And every time I experience that, you know, God's, God's power and God's answer prayer, my faith has grown and grown and grown. And I, if I were to stand here and share with you all the things that has helped my faith to grow, believe you me when I say that it will take me 10 hours for me to share all the things that God has done in my life to help me to grow. But even just share with you some of the major things that God has done that helped me to grow and trust in God is. You know, three years ago, three and a half years ago, I was at a really a wonderful and healthy church where people love me and I love them. But I really felt like God was telling me, Paul, it's time for you to move on. And I said, okay, God. I feel like, okay, God, it's time for me to move on. But Lord, where? God, you know, I've been a pastor for over 10 years. You know, what kind of a job can I get? I still need to make money. God, you know, where do you want me to go? And I say, God, you know, right now, I don't want to go right into another church, but I want to kind of rest. But God, where? And really, I had no plans. When I, when I submitted my resignation, I had no plans. I had no places. I had nothing laid out. But I believed and trusted in God because I felt it was God that was telling me. So I said, okay, God, I trust you. Well, two weeks later, a friend of mine called and said, Paul, you know, are, are, are you like looking for a... Actually, I was on a mission trip to China, <laughs> of all places. And during that time, a friend of mine said, you know, Paul, are you looking for... You, have you found a place to go? I said, no. Actually, it was Pastor Peter. I said, no, Peter. And he's like, you know, I know a school in Korea. And they're looking for a, a teacher. And I'd say, Peter, you know, I like Korea. I don't want to go to Korea, but I don't want to go to Korea and teach English. I'm a pastor. You know, I want to do something that's related to the Bible and ministry. And Peter said, Paul, this is a Christian school. And they're looking for a, a Bible teacher, a Bible, you know, Bible teacher. I'm like, really? I say, oh, you know, but, um, you know, what about my children? Well, your children's education is taken care of for free. Really? You know, my wife is looking for work too, but, you know, she's not a really a native speaker, so she can't teach English. And I say, really? I don't know. Why don't you ask? So I called the school and I talked to the principal. And he was like, wow, really? You know, we, you know, we need a job. I said, what about your wife? I said, well, she speaks English well, but she, you know, she's not a native speaker. She's not a U.S. citizen. I said, really, what's your wife's major? And I said, my wife is art. And she goes, really? We're looking for an art teacher. Just amazing. Amazing how things worked. And so we ended up, we went, and we packed up, and we went there. Our goal, our plan was to just stay in Korea for a year. But then, you know, one year led to the second year. But I said, God, I want to do ministry. You know, teaching Bible is wonderful. You know, I, I, I led chapel there. I, I preached every Sunday. That was great. But I told God, you've called me to be a pastor, and I want to be a pastor. But at the same time, we also had a you know, burden and passion for mission. That means my wife and I, we've been to mission. We visited China, Japan. I've been to personally many other countries. And I really felt like God was drawing me to minister not just to one people group, but many people group. And then all of a sudden, uh, you know, I, was, I wanted to visit different churches. And, and Pastor Chung, the senior pastor of Everlo Baptist Church, he and I were actually friends back in America. In America, there's no age difference. You're all friends. And he was, while he was doing his PhD, I was doing my master's, so we knew each other. And I had heard that he had a church here, so I said, okay, you know, I just wanted to just come and worship. And I emailed him and said, you know, I'm just coming. That's the kind of the protocol, you know, right thing to do. And I emailed him and said, you know, I want to come and visit. And I just wanted you to know that I'm coming. And he replied back to me a few hours later that very day and said, we've been praying for a pastor to come and to minister to our global ministry. Will you please consider? And, I, and 
And in my mind, I'm like, no. <laughs> it wasn't the first time that I was offered a position in Korea. I said, no. But then I came here to worship. And I remember the first day, no one is here from that time. This was almost two years ago. I came here, and I went upstairs to this room in the back. And in that room sat about eight Indian, Indian gentlemen. They were sitting there. And to be honest with you, they looked very, very sad. <laughs> But I came and I started talking to them, and they were really, really wonderful people. And I don't know why. That day, as I was leaving, I don't know even till this day who it was, there was this man, and they were speaking in Russian. I'm like, what? It wasn't Dr. Kim, it was a Russian man. I'm like, and my wife and I, on our way back, we were talking to ourselves. You know, we have a heart for mission. It was the first time, we, you know, my wife said to me, wow, this is a, I've been to China, I've been to Japan. But this is the first time I've actually felt like we're at a mission field. And this is something that we've been praying about. And it's amazing at that exact moment that we said, you know, God, you know, I want to do ministry. God provided. And then we came here and the ministry was good. But to make the long story short, I needed to get another job. Because, you know, I hate to say these things, but the church couldn't provide everything that I needed. Like, you know, I'm not going to get into that. But I needed to find another job. So I say, pray to God, God, I need to make money. I need a job that's going to like, provide insurance, help with housing. And, and also, God, we only have one car. I need to find a job where I can at least close by so I don't have to travel too much and so forth. And, and then all of a sudden, a public school job 200 meters away from my apartment, it came. The pay was not bad. They provided housing benefit, insurance. All of those things. And the hour was good. Free weekends, you know, long summer and winter vacation. I'm like, this is exactly what I've been praying about. And then I worked. But then, <laughs> it wasn't as good as I thought. Teaching junior high kids English was really difficult. <laughs> In fact, it was, it was exhausting mentally. And I said, God, I did not come here to teach English. I came here to do ministry. And this is getting in the way. I just don't have the time or the energy to do ministry. And God, I need something else. And then all of a sudden, God provided at that time a position at Chungnam University. And let me tell you this, you know, a lot of people like me and say I'm a good teacher. But I really don't, don't have the qualifications to teach English at a university level. First of all, my undergrad degree is business. My graduate degree is theology. And, second, and third of all, I don't have the yellow, you know, yellow hair, blue eyes, and pale skin that uh, most schools look for. Even though I lived in America longer than Luke's been alive. But they want somebody like Luke, or Ben or Damien for that matter. They don't want the Asian looking face. You know, they see me and they see Korean Ajashi. But the amazing thing was this. The time that I interviewed, the, the, you know, in America, the department head, they rotate. It's not that one person becomes department head for a long time. And it so happened, the department head that was interviewing the time that I applied was a devoted Christian. In fact, he is a good friend of one of the pastor, associate pastors there. And when he saw my resume, he really wanted me to come because he saw that I went to seminary and all that. When he went to the uh, other people, they said, we don't want him. He's Asian. He's Korean. We want somebody that has blonde hair, blue eyes, and white skin. We don't want this guy. But this department head, because of his devo you know, faith in God, he said, we, I want more Christians to be at our school. So he pushed for me to get that uh, position. My point is, I should not have this job, a cushy job where I teach college students you know, flexible hours in my own office. But I got the job. And again, God has proven to me that whatever I needed, whatever I ask, he does it if it's best for me. And over the years, I can, I can tell you countless testimonies and experiences of how God has provided for me, answered my prayers over and over and over again. And every time I exercise, I exercise my faith and trust in God, He has never failed me. In every one of those instances, all it does is help me to grow in my faith in God. So how do we grow in our faith? First of all, we have to choose. 
We cannot just simply say, you know what, I'm just going to wait until I believe in everything. Well, that moment will never come because there is no such thing. That is not faith. We have to choose to believe. We have to decide, make a decision. Say, so, you know what, I've seen a lot. I've, I've read a lot. I've witnessed a lot. And my heart is, you know, is, 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 you know, is, is, is what do you call it? My heart is, is stirring inside. Then we have to make a decision and say, you know what? I'm, I don't understand everything. But I'm going to choose to have faith. And once that is done, the Bible says, in 2 Chronicles 7.14, it says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sins. What that means is this. When we truly submit ourselves and trust in God, it is at that moment God said he will come and he will be with us. He will give us faith. And then we live our lives. And how can we grow our faith? We grow our faith by practicing it and exercising it. We grow our faith by we living Matthew 6, 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And he will provide everything else that we need for us. If, you know, we practice our faith by practicing Matthew 6, 33. We trust in God with our family. We trust in God with our job. We trust in God with our finances. We trust in God with our children. We trust in God with everything else. Even though it seems like, you know what, I don't know what to do. It seems like life is not going well. But we choose to continue to trust in God and seek after Him. We say to ourselves, you know what, maybe I need to work 20 more hours a week to make this work. Maybe I should, no. I'm going to seek first His kingdom. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to pray. I will work, but I will seek God first and trust in Him. We say to ourselves, you know what, our children, they're messed up. They're doing drugs. They're running away, hanging around the background. Maybe I need to take them to the counselor. Maybe I need to quit my job. Maybe I need to do this. No, we trust in God. We seek first His kingdom. We come before God. We pray. We devote ourselves. Come to church in prayer. Seek after Him more. We trust in Him and watch Him at work. We say to ourselves, my husband lost his job or our business failed. We're failing. What are we going to do? Maybe we should do this. Maybe I need to you know, go all over, you know, work 24 hours a day, or maybe I need to borrow money. Fine, maybe you have to do that. But you know what? Before I do any of those things, I will first seek His kingdom and His righteousness. I will trust in Him first. And as we do that, and as we experience God blessing us and answering our prayers, our faith grows. That is faith. And it is that faith, not works, but it is that faith that saves us and gives us eternal life. And it is my prayer that in this room, that sooner or later, and hopefully sooner, that we will all make a decision to have faith. And after that, that we will make a decision to practice and exercise that faith. And I pray that we will all grow in our faith in God, where we will never waver, where our faith will never be shaken, because we believe and trust in our Almighty God, our Father. Let us pray.